Excellent way of lighting the fire. Now a piece this size will burn for about 20 minutes. Knowing how to light a fire is not enough. We must practice it. We must be confident before we find ourselves in a survival situation that we can light a fire. Remember, now we've got a shelter, we've got a fire, we are protected. The next thing we've got to worry about is being found. Lofty, you made starting a fire with a flint and steel look so easy. How did you do that? Steve, it really is easy. Even when wet, okay, using a striker, and a downward movement like so, have a go. I'm sure you do it. Think I can do this, huh? There's some cotton wool. Okay. Let's get the right side there. Let's do it. We'll try it again here. Yep. There you and go. And there we go. And we got fire. It's as easy as that. Okay. Okay. Now, you said also not to cut into the magnesium flare. What was that about? Okay, this type of aerial flare, there's a rocket motor here and there's a magnesium block here. Now, cutting into it could cause friction and it could go off causing serious injury and burns. Also, if you fire this on anything that's solid, it will bounce back again causing injury. So when we lit the fire from it, we dug a hole, we lined it with energy absorbing material like dry leaves and grasses, put all our tinder at the back, prepared our fireplace, and when we fire this into it, we look away, the ball of magnesium goes out, ignites our tinder, it starts the fire. If it hits anything solid, it will bounce back and can cause serious injury. So never cut into your flare and prepare your fireplace carefully if you're gonna use this to light a fire. Okay, you also mentioned starting a fire with a flashlight. Right, okay, this is the flashlight we used. If you go back to the field, we'll show you how we done it. Okay. You can use your flashlight to start a fire. Now a useful tip is at the base of the flashlight, carry four zero steel wool and spare bulbs. Also, keep the last battery around the wrong way. This way the torch won't go off accidentally in your pack. Turn it round to use it. And the way I'm going to light a fire using the torch is I remove the reflector and across the two terminals I'm going to short circuit the battery using the steel wool. Prepare the fire, bridge the terminal with a wire wood, and add some of your chemicals to the side. Then turn on the torch. And that's how easy it is to light the fire. Well, that seemed to work really well, but it didn't do the flashlight any good. Oh, it sure didn't, Steve, but remember, in a cold climate, we must have a fire. So if you've got no other means of lighting a fire, it's okay to sacrifice your flashlight. So remember, we must have fire. It's the difference between life and death in a cold situation. All right. Okay, we've covered protection. We've looked around our local area. We've gotten out of immediate danger. We've constructed a shelter, and we've got fire. And now we're ready for the next element in our plan. In the first part of our outdoor survival program, Lofty Wiseman told us about a plan for survival. And we learned that protection is the first priority. Safety from immediate danger, constructing a shelter, and starting a fire. Now we're ready for the next step of our survival plan, location. Lofty, what do you mean by location? Okay, Steve, what we must do is put out grand air signals in the hope of being found. Now, regardless of what sort of journey we undergo, we always alert the authorities, be it the forest rangers or the coast guards, and we tell them where we're going, what time we're expected at the other end, so when we've gone missing, people are aware that we are um, maybe in danger and they know where to search for us. However, in a survival situation, it arises because of freak weather, instrument failure, and we find ourselves somewhere on the ground and we ain't got a clue where we are. So we must have the ability to draw attention to ourselves. Okay, draw attention to ourselves. What visual signals can we make? Okay, the, the best one is the fire triangle. If you look here, this is what it looks like. Once we've got protection, we now go on to location. This entails putting out ground to air panels so we can be found. Here we've got the fire triangle. It's a tripod dug into the ground with a platform built on it. On the platform, we prepare our fire exactly as we did before. We feather our wood, but now we use pine resin 
any inflammable material from the aircraft or the wreckage, like petrol, oil, lubricants, rubber tyres, upholstery. So just one match will ignite it. We cover the whole thing in fir branches. Now this keeps it dry, it's off the ground, so don't matter if it snows or floods, the fire is always dry. When we ignite this, we leave the green stuff on by day, this generates the smoke. Of a night, we take it off and we just have a bright flame. We've got spare wood underneath, and so all we're waiting for now is the aircraft to come and we ignite it. As you see, we've got three fires in a triangle. This is the international distress signal. All we've got to do now is cover this up and wait for aircraft. It seems to me there's a good chance that the aircraft will be long gone before you get your fires lit. Yeah, that's exactly right, Steve. However, the aircraft flies a particular pattern called a baseline search. What it does, it overlaps itself, covering the ground, flying up and down. So hopefully when the aircraft, okay, passes you, you hear it's approaching, you light your fires, and it's probably missed them. However, eventually it will turn around, fly downwind again, and when it passes you this time, it should pick up your signals. So it's passed your signals, it's made a downward leg on the way back, it sees your signals, it starts circling the area, indicating that it's seen you. So by day, it will circle your position, waggle its wings, and by night, it will flash its lights. And this will indicate that you've been discovered. Are there any other signals we should be thinking about? Yes, we've got to put out our grand air signals. This way we can communicate with the aircraft. Now, using the aluminum foil from the survival pouch, we can make different figures which are internationally understood. Now, this is nice and bright, and it stands out well. Now, we can improvise this if we've got nothing else by using clothing. Most anoraks and sleeping bags, they're brightly colored. Blues and oranges are great. We can also dig trenches down, or turn stones over, or even trample snow to make these figures which will stand out from the air. What figures do we have to know? OK, it's real easy. If you remember this, F, I require food and water. Most important is one bar, I need immediate assistance. And an aircraft will take a lot of risk to come down and see what's wrong. OK, two L's means all is well. So now we see Phil, it's real easy to remember. Now the aircraft will drop a message. Now initially the aircraft will be a fixed wing aircraft because it's got the range and duration. So it can't come down and land. So it would drop a message and it will say something like, do you need assistance? So you say yes, affirmative. It drop another message, do you know where you are? Negative. So if you remember this, F I double L, Y and N, affirmative, negative, that's all we need to know. Okay, that seems real simple. Now, are these panels going to attract an aircraft's attention or is there a better way to do this? Um, most rescues have been affected by the use of a heliograph. And this is just a shiny, reflective material. It can be improvised, hubcap, piece of glass from the wreckage, or the shiny underside of your survival tin. In this case, we've got a heliograph or a signal mirror, and we just pick up the sun's rays on our hand, direct them up to the aircraft, and looking through the sighting hole, we use it as a signal mirror. Okay. Under ideal conditions, it's good for 15 miles. I recall that we used a flare to start a fire, but their primary purpose is signaling. What kinds would you carry? Okay, um, we carry smoke, flares, and also para-illuminating flares. And what we got, we always use a contrasting color. In this case, we're using yellow smoke, and as you see, it stands out real well against the trees, so don't use green if you're in thick vegetation. Always a contrast. So any color smoke is good as long as it stands out. All right, the smoke signal is good for the daytime. What do we do at night? OK, Steve, we use our flare, and we must be careful. We must make sure there's no obstruction above where we're going to fire it, like we're underneath the tree, so we must be in the open. And also, when we fire it, keep it at arm's length and look away. Sometimes you do get particles coming back. Now, this particular flare goes up to 600 feet. It's very bright, and it can be seen from a, a long distance away. And if we've got the, the, the space and, and the room, we take an even bigger flare. Sure. Here you see a para-illuminating flare. And what it does, exactly the same. You must make sure there's no overhead obstruction. You fire it to the air, and it probably goes up to 1,000 feet. And now it's suspended under a parachute. So it stays in the air for a long time. And so you've got more chance of being seen. Lofty, what about the EPIRBs, emergency radio beacons? These are small battery-operated transmitters that can be received by aircraft and, and now even by satellites. They're very lightweight, half a pound or so. Uh, are these a good idea? Yeah, they sure are. If you've got the room to take them, 
You never got enough kit in an emergency situation. Yep, they're excellent. All right. Now we've completed the second part of our plan for survival, location. We've constructed a fire triangle, learned how to communicate with aircraft with signal panels, heliograph, and flares. Next in our outdoor survival program, we'll talk about acquisition, getting what we need so we can survive until rescue comes. Water sustains life. If you follow any water course in the world, eventually it would lead you to safety. Now, 90% of all sickness in a survival situation is caused by drinking bad water. So what we must do is sterilize it. There are two ways of sterilizing water. One is by boiling, the second one is by chemicals. You can take your sterilizing tablets from the survival kit and we can use these to sterilize water. However, it's always best first to filter your water. I've got a filter here, let's fill it up before we sterilize. Now, this is a canvas bag of porous material and it allows water to drip to the bottom and I'm going to collect it and this is where I'm going to put my chlorine tablet. It's important, especially if I get my water from muddy puddles and it's heavily sedimented because the chlorine in these tablets attack the major particles, leaving the water still suspect. Now we can carry one of these, but in a survival situation, we can improvise one. Let's have a look what I've got over here. This is an improvised filter made from a sock. What we got is a layer of charcoal, sand, and moss and grass. What we do now is pour the water through this and collect at the other end. As the water is filtering through, we collect it at the bottom. Here's a selection of water containers. This one was specially developed for special forces and is ideal for the base camp. To get water, you just press against the side. Here we have water. This one is a bladder which can be filled up and carried. Using the condom from the survival tin, we can carefully put two pints of water into it. We must wrap this up in cloth and use this just as a membrane. The best way of sterilizing water is by boiling. If we're lucky enough to have a can, use the wire from the survival tin to make a handle. Never leave the tin balancing on burning embers or on rocks, as it will topple and you'll lose your water and probably put the fire out. Now boil the water for seven minutes at sea level. For every thousand feet of elevation, add another minute. Potassium permanganate is a good way of sterilizing water. The small container like this from the survival tin is good for sterilizing 300 gallons of water. Now, it's important that we get the color just right. If I don't put sufficient in, the water will still be suspect. If I put too much in, the water becomes caustic. So in a small amount of water like this, just one or two crystals is sufficient. And we go by color. We want this to be a light pink. That's just about the right color. This is a dried up water course. And if we dig down long enough, deep enough, eventually we come to water. We can still collect that water, however, but we now can let the trees pump it up for us. Take a plastic bag and place it on the leaf of any green tree and the tree acts as a pump. It takes the water from the ground and we get evaporation in the plastic bag and all we gotta do is collect it without all the manual labor of digging for it. This is a solar still that we use in semi-arid and desert conditions. It's a meter square of plastic sheet. You dig a hole a meter square, one meter deep and you arrange the plastic sheet and weight it so it forms a V. Now what happens, this causes condensation. Water, it forms underneath the V and it runs down to the bottom and you need a container underneath to collect the moisture. We can make this more efficient by putting any green vegetation in it or urinating in it. To save disturbing the still, we can also use a siphon.
Now with a siphon, you can take the water exactly when you need it. There's no need to purify the water, it's absolutely pure. Now as you can see in the still, it's also a good insect trap. Let's have a look underneath the still and see how much water we have collected. Under ideal conditions, this is good for a quart of water. We've got probably a pint here spending six hours, so we're doing okay. Now, don't make these any bigger. The metre square is the optimum. If you need more water, carry more sheets of polythene and dig more solar stills. Ensure that the siphon is right to the bottom of your collector. Now, as you can see, the water is nice and pure and does not need sterilising. Remember, if you're going to urinate in here, make sure you do it before you put in the collecting pot. Another method of collecting water is a dew trap. Let's take a look at one. This is a dew trap. What we've got now is clear plastic sheet in a hole a foot square and a foot deep. In the hole we place clean, smooth rocks. Now this still has been working all night for us. The way it works is the plastic cools off more rapidly than the hot stone. And this creates condensation. Now you must ensure you take the water out before the sun comes up. Otherwise, it works in reverse and it starts evaporating the water that you've collected. Still using the sun, I'd like to show you now a solar still inverted. Here, we've got a source of suspect water. What we're going to do is take clear plastic sheet in, put it over the top of it, seal it around the bottom, and the sun's going to do the rest. With all these solar stools, we must use clear plastic sheeting, not the dark variety. In this case, I've put a pebble in the centre of my plastic sheet, I've tied it around to form an anchor point, and I've suspended it from a convenient branch. I've then formed a tent over the suspect water, and then I've carefully rolled the polythene inside, and this is going to trap the water as it evaporates inside my tent. I've sealed it all the way around the edge, and we leave this now and the warmer the sun is, the better this works. Okay, Lofty, I understand how the solar still works, but tell me again how you get the water out. Okay, we carefully wrap the polythene underneath, and when we want the water, what we do, we start lifting it out from the side carefully and tilting it to the lowest part of the still, and in time, we turn the still right upside down, and the water's all collected in the polythene curl at the lowest point. After the water is filtered, like you did in the sock, is the water safe to drink at that point? No, Steve, we must always treat the water. Regardless of water source or how clear and sparkling the water looks, the filter only takes out the suspended matter, it don't take out the bacteria. So we must always treat what we've got in our container, either by boiling or by chemicals. Okay, boiling water's okay if you have a metal container, but what if you don't have one? Okay, Steve, Imagine this is a sheet of birch bark. We can fold this carefully. Okay, fold in the sides, fold at the ends, make the creases to the rear, fold it over to the same this end. What we made now is a coolerman. Now, if we put this, okay, on ashes filled with water, what we got, we got moisture inside, indirect heat, and the water will boil in this without rupturing the vessel. <laughs> Very clever. Lofty, why don't you sum up the important things we need to remember about water? Okay, Steve, every living thing on Earth is dependent on water. So what we say is we go three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food with no ill effects. So regardless of water source, we must always treat it. Now, if we've not got any water, we just don't eat, because it takes all our body fluids to assimilate the food. And fats and proteins are the worst. And also, appetite will suffer so if we've got no water, we don't eat. However, if we've got water, a plentiful supply of good water, we can eat just about anything. And in tight situations, it's been recorded that people have eaten their leather boots and they've got protein from it. But you must have lots of water to digest it and for the body to assimilate the food. Okay, let's hope we don't have to eat our boots. You've mentioned food. Now, what kinds of food are we going to find in the wild? Okay, Steve, in the wild, there's a variety of foods and it starts with the nutritional ladder. 
Right at the bottom, we got plants. Now, it's just a matter of recognition and picking. They're not going to run away. And then we build up fungi, slightly more nutritional value than plants. Insects, probably the first living thing an injured person can get are insects. Above insects come fish. If you're lucky enough to be, to be by water, we've got the fish in the water. And then finally, game. Pound for pound, we can't beat meat. Of all the plants available, some are edible, some may even be poisonous. How can we tell the difference? Okay, with plants, and it's only plants, we've got an edibility test. This is the edibility test. We pick a fresh specimen, and first we use the senses. Feel it, it might be prickly or hairy, and this will indicate what it is. Next, we crush it and we smell it. There may be a familiar smell, like mint or garlic. This will also indicate what it is. We then take a small portion and we place it underneath the tongue, and this is where the flavour buds are. Now, if there's any discomfort, like a burning or stinging sensation, discard it, you've got a poisonous plant. There are two poisons in the plant kingdom, and they're both accompanied by the same sign, i.e. a burning, stinging sensation. Now, one is water-soluble, one is not. So with nettles, when we boil them, we destroy the toxin, and they're safe to eat. If we do the same with rhubarb leaves, we concentrate the poison. Now, if there's no discomfort, we chew the same piece, and we put all the juice around the mouth, and we spit it out. We wait a further five minutes, and again, any discomfort, discard the test. Finally, we swallow the same specimen, and now we wait five hours. If there's no ill effect, we can say that plant is safe to eat. However, it's a long drawn out process, and it's so much easier to identify some of the common plants, so let's go and have a look and see what we can find. The bulrush is an excellent source of nourishment. Now in late summer, it's got the familiar seed spike on the top, and we can eat all parts of this. What we're looking for here is the rootstock. Now the root of any plant is a storehouse, and it contains good starch, so it's an excellent source of nourishment. The dandelion is very common and easily recognised by its flower. When it's not in bloom, its distinctive leaf also helps to identify it. Now all parts of the plant are edible and we cook the leaf just like spinach. Now the plant also has a tap root and if we expose this, it's best by roasting the root and it also makes a palatable coffee. We can also cook this like parsnip. The plantain is very common, and we can use it as spinach, but it does taste bitter. In late summer, it's got a seed spike here, which is full of seeds. Now, these seeds contain oil. If we put these in the soup, we're going to get good nutritional value. We can also use all the plant medicinally, where if we put it on a wound, it does help stop bleeding. Mint is an excellent flavouring when we add it to our stew. It's easily identified by its distinctive smell. We can also use it medicinally if we mix it with charcoal and take it for an upset stomach. The charcoal helps to draw the toxins and the mint settles the stomach. The stinging nettle is an excellent source of nourishment. It's plentiful and it's easily identified. If you brush against it, you get stung. And the best way to remedy that is take a pinch of the plant, crush it and rub it on the stung part. Now, the stinging sensation is caused by formic acid. And as soon as we boil this, that's eliminated. Now, the nettle contains vitamins and minerals, and we make a nettle tea by taking a handful of the leaf, boil it, and if we drink this, it's full of iron, and it's a good pick-me-up. The dried stems are really tough and can be used as twine. Also, if we want to dye our clothing green, we just put it in with a selection of leaf, boil it all together, and we finish up with an olive drab material. You can make a useful tea using pine needles. Pine needles contain vitamins, especially vitamin C. Take a pint of water and boil it, allow it to cool. Take a handful of pine needles and let them seep in the water. Now don't boil the needles in the water, otherwise you'll destroy the vitamin content. Now when you're feeling weak and lethargic, try some pine needle tea because it acts as a stimulant and a tonic. It's a pick-me-up. Also, while you're by the edge of a wood, have a look around, you might find some useful fungi. Fungi come above plants on a nutritional ladder. Pound for pound, they've got more nourishment. However, with plants, we've got an edibility test. 
With fungi, it must be one of positive recognition. If you're not sure, leave them alone. Now, fungi is just a plant without chlorophyll, so consequently, it must feed on dead or decaying matter. Now, the big drawback with fungi is some are deadly. Just here, we've got the worst case, the Amanita phylloides, or the death cat. Now, this has got the following characteristics. It's got a vulva, it's got a ring, it's got white gills. Now, the season for this is summer, late autumn. You never find it in pastures or meadows, only in or around woodlands. Now, there's three bad things about this fungi. One, it smells of raw potatoes, so it's a familiar smell. Secondly, it tastes sweet. Thirdly, and the worst case, nothing happens after eating between five and 18 hours. What it is, is a series of alkaloids, and when it mixes with your body chemistry, it sets up toxins. And these are distributed in every cell of the body. So you must get medical attention quickly. The Amanita phylloides accounts for 90% of all fatalities due to fungi poisoning. The first living thing an injured person in a survival situation can obtain are insects. They are plentiful and give us good protein. Things like worms, ants, termites are excellent eating. Every primitive tribe in the world, they recognise this fact and they consider them as delicacies. Here we've got an ant hill and if we just dig down, we can obtain the ants. What we do is get this, put it in water, and let them float to the top, skim them off, then we boil them, and ants contain formic acid, just like nettles, and boiling gets rid of this toxin. Lofty, you told us that we need to boil nettles to destroy formic acid. Do we need to then drain off the water, or can